All right, people, welcome to Unit 8, Topic 8.8, .8, The End of the Cold War. Here we go. So by the end of this lesson, you're going to be able to do two things. You're going to understand how Soviet reforms under Miguel, Mikhail Gorbachev led to the end of the Cold War. And you're going to understand how the Soviet-Afghan War helped cause the end of the Cold War. And we're going to look at the, Af the Soviet-Afghan conflict first. Then we're going to look at Gorbachev's reforms. And you're going to understand how to explain and make connections between historical developments by building your claim, right? Let's take a look. Follow along closely. All right. What are some of the causes for the end of the Cold War? You got three major causes here. Number one, the advances in the U.S. military and the technological development. It cost a lot of money to do that. So the Cold War was partly a game of using your money wisely. The United States did, and you can argue the Soviet Union did not, right? The Soviet Union's costly and untimely failed invasion of Afghanistan. We're going to dive deep into that in a minute. And the public discontent, economic weakness in communist countries, non-Russian communist countries that were controlled uh, um, uh, by Russia. So we're going to take a look at that discontent that grows. It all led to the end of the Cold War and the collapse of the Soviet Union. So the major proxy wars, you had the Korean War, the Vietnam War, and the Soviet-Afghan War were the three big wars that were proxy. We're going to take a look at the Soviet-Afghan War. So let's look. Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. The military conflict from 1979 to 1989, it was a decade where the Soviet Union supported the Marxist government of the Democratic Republic of Afghanistan against the indigenous Afghan Mujahideen rebels. Okay, they were grassroots. They were local. The Soviet Afghan war. It was a proxy war in the broader context of the late Cold War. The goal of the USSR was to keep and expand the power of communist Afghanistan government. One of the main tools that helped the Soviets battle the Mujahideen was air power, the use of their attack helicopters. Um, a great visual, a loosely based historical account of the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, this proxy war, is a movie, a Hollywood movie called Charlie Wilson's War with Tom Hanks. Very interesting, entertaining movie, but you can see how these attack helicopters uh, command complete control of the people on the ground through just an indiscriminate murder and, and destroying the villages where they believe like the rebels, the Mujahideen are hiding. And then you can see how the United States figured out how to arm those uh, uh, local grassroots rebels um, with surface to air missiles, the use of superior technology. They were able to blow up Soviet tanks and Soviet helicopters, and the Soviets just kept pumping millions and millions into the billions of dollars to try to win this particular little war. So it was very much ego as well. The eyes of the world were on this proxy war, and the United States had the superior technology. So the United States supported the Mujahideen rebels against USR to stop the spread of communism by giving them money and military supplies. Handheld surface-to-air missiles, and that was the big one. Today, we think about it as like RPGs. These enabled them to shoot down Soviet helicopters, which was a major turning point in the war. Okay, So how did the Soviet-Afghan war lead to the end of the entire Cold War? Well, the unsuccessful Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, it was an expensive failure, as I've just previously stated. It helped prevent the Soviet military from closing the growing technological gaps within the United States military. And it showed other nations that wanted to break away from the USSR that the Red Army was not invincible. So there was growing discontent within the Soviet Union of many of those other regions, those other countries that were under the grip of the Soviet Union. And once they saw this grassroots campaign, these rebels beat the mighty Soviets with the help of the United States, it really sparked mass movement and mass rebellion against the Soviet Union and the dominoes collapsed. And this was the first domino. So now let's look at another end for the cause of the Cold War. Uh, the third, number three, we're going to focus on that now. Public discontent and economic weakness in communist countries. Let's dive deeper into this. 
Okay. All right. Along with the loss in Afghanistan, you had reforms that were made under Mikhail Gorbachev. So by the end of the Soviet Afghan war, the Soviet economy was extremely weak and shortages of consumer goods and especially food were common. All right. So now Mikhail Gorbachev knows if, if the Soviet Union does not make at least some progressive reforms, we're done here. So this is like one last grip. They're drowning. They're reaching for any way that they can keep the Soviet Union together. And this goes against these reforms. They go against what Soviet Union stands for, but they know this was their one last chance to keep it together. So in 1985 to 1991, Gorbachev began dismantling the command economy and moving toward a mixed economy. That is more democratically progressive than they've ever been before. This was called glasnost and uh, Priestrestroika, 1986 policies instituted to try and save the collapsing economy. So Glasnost was the policy of openness and some political liberties, such as freedom of press and assembly, this was unheard of in the Soviet Union. It led to the press being able to openly criticize the Soviet government. You would disappear previously if you ever did that. And it led to increased protests in nations in the Soviet bloc for rights and independence from their respective communist governments in the USSR. I was a child younger than you in the 1980s watching this on the news. This was all that was on the news in America it was the slow unfolding and collapse of the Soviet Union, which started with these progressive reforms. Okay. So perestroika is the policy of economic restructuring that allowed for more private ownership and decentralized control in industry and agriculture. Sounds like capitalism to me. Let's see what happens. Fall of the Berlin Wall was the big one. This was the symbol. The Berlin Wall was the separation barrier between Eastern Berlin and Western Berlin from 1961 to 1989, built to stop the migration. They wanted to keep the ideology separated in response to the lack of consumer goods and jobs. So due to the poor economy and the restrictive communist governments, reform movements were already occurring in the Soviet bloc such as in Czechoslovakia, Poland, and Hungary. This revolutionary fervor would spread to East Germany. The Cold War symbolically ended in 1989 with the end of the, with the fall of the Berlin Wall. Again, I previously told you I was a child watching this and, and, and just everybody was just so emotional about it in America. And their stories just circulated our country and our media of families torn apart for over 40 years you could not see your loved ones and now they're both on the each sides of the berlin wall and people are chipping away large portions of it and the cameras are right in their faces as they embrace for the first time in 40 years it's very emotional by 1991 soviet states like estonia and lithuania will declare their independence breaking up the soviet union gorbachev oversaw a peaceful transition to democracy and the result usa will become the main global superpower on planet earth after the collapse of the Soviet Union. You ready? Let's go. To what extent was the collapse of the Soviet Union due to external foreign political forces? Three documents, 50 plus make groups and a claim. 15 minutes. Ready? To what extent, so it was to a greater extent or lesser extent, was the collapse of the Soviet Union, well, who caused the collapse of the Soviet Union? Was it external foreign countries or was it internal political forces? So now is it external? Whenever they do this, external, so now you're looking for external and internal. That's all you're looking for. And then you're adding them up. If you stay inside the document, that's the argument you make. That's more. If you want to go outside the documents, then you have to show the limit of the document and the greater historical context to back it up. So let's start by staying inside the documents. All right, document A, is it internal, external, or both? Um, anybody wanna talk about document A? All right, Alexa, internal, external, or both? I said it was internal. Okay, why? It was talking about like inner forces, how like they were like failing exploitation and that like played like a really dramatic effect on them and kind of corrupted them. All right. 
So Vaclav Havel, president of Czechoslovakia, speaks on the negative impact of Soviet domestic policy. That is internal legislative policies to persuade communist authorities to provide reforms. That's what it's about. Document A is internal. All right. This is internal. Would anybody like to uh, claim that is external as well? All right, so we all agree document A is internal. Document B, raise your digital hand. All right, so first one was Jeremy. Jeremy, short and sweet. Is document B internal, external, or both? Document B is external because the it's about the Afghanistan war, which the Soviet Union was losing, and they also were getting more and more criticism from the rest of the world from uh, fr from during. Ah, never mind. Yes. So, document B is external because the U.S. military proxy assistance contributed to Afghan victory. That's an external force. Does anybody also, does anybody want to contend that it's internal to raise your digital hand? Kendall, tell us why. Where in the document, Kendall? Um, I don't really know exactly where in the document, but I know from greater context that it was the so like it was a bad decision of the Soviets to go attack Afghanistan in the first place. So you can argue that it was like it was it was an internal like decision to go invade Afghanistan. So that's why it could be an internal cause, but based on the information in the document, it's um, primarily an external force. Okay, so Kendall, you guessed right that there is internal, but you always have to use evidence to back up your claim or you, or claim or you lack credibility. Everybody look at what I'm highlighting. Opposition to the war from citizens in non-Russian Soviet republics. These are the angry people increased since their presence was often not even acknowledged by authorities who wished to play down Soviet involvement in Afghanistan. These Afghani became bitter and openly critical of Soviet leaders, the veterans. Soviet cities grew substantially and the war veterans increasingly became part of the Soviet urban landscape. Oh, I go fight for you, the Soviet Union. I'm a proud Soviet and now I get dismissed. And I don't get any help from the government that's supposed to help people. Look at the resentment, evidence of resentment. So it's also internal because non-Russian Soviet resentment grew from a lack of support of the from the war veterans. So it's ex external and internal. You can't really argue which one was stronger than the other here without going outside the documents. You'd have to show limits if you want to go outside. But this is both. Third one. Who wants to come? Whoa, hold on. Who was that? Per okay, Alana. Internal, external, or both? Document um, C. I said that it was internal because it said that Soviet agri agriculture was suffering with grain and that it was really difficult to buy in the international market, which caused them to have to reach out to or have to think about reaching out to Western forces in order to purchase the grain needed to feed the population. Okay, Alana, I love how you use direct evidence right out of the document. And that's what you have make sure that you do that when you're doing your DBQ essay for the college board exam. It's definitely internal because of so many reasons. Look, right out of the document, it's internal because uh, the Soviet Union mismanaged their uh their own natural environment through agricultural issues the soviet union misjudged the petroleum market the soviet union mistakenly borrowed from capitalists which went against everything they believed in and it all led to the soviet failure to put down rebellions inside their own borders all evidenced in the document does anybody want to contend it's external too can i Go for it, Leah. Um, because the Western Western forces refused to um, lend the Soviet Union money. So in that way, it's also external because if they had gone in the money, then they would have been better off. Okay, you are correct, Leah. Just make sure you are more clear in that statement. It's definitely external and it's definitely because of your explanation. But to clarify it, what you would write is that 
it's external because the Western powers had leverage. They actually had leverage. They had control over Soviet decisions. Why? Because Soviet resentment, look right in the document, um, internal activities of the Soviet Union, it cannot send in. So, uh, wait, let me get to it. Um, the Soviet Union needed to borrow funds from Western banks, right, to purchase the needed grain. So the Soviet Union is begging on its knees to its mortal enemy, please, we need money, our people are starving to death. So this severely restricted the international activities of the Soviet Union. Now the Soviet Union can't keep spreading communism and, and try and draw heavy influence uh, to non-communist countries to make them communist. Do you know why? Because they couldn't, and they couldn't keep sending troops to put down the rebellion against communism from all the angry Soviets that are being swept under the rug, especially the war veterans, right? Because such an action would have resulted in a refusal of Western sources to lend the money that the Soviet Union needed. That's external force. So, like the United States of America is like, we've got you now, Soviet Union. Your people are starving to death. Every mistake, every decision you've made internally has been a mistake and you're suffering because of it. You desperately need money to feed your people. Here we go. We'll give you the money. Don't spread any more communism. We'll give you the money. Hey, by the way, yeah, uh, some of the people inside of your borders of your countries that you control, they're turning to us as well. Oh, they're starting to rebel against you. Don't you put down those rebellions and we'll take our money back. See how the United States is starting to gain major economic leverage over the Soviet Union. So this one is both internal and external. You can make the argument that one is more powerful than the other, but you've got to show limits to this document and go outside of it. So by staying inside the document now, document A is just internal. Document B is internal and external. Document C is internal and external. When you add them all up, there's more internal than external. So by staying inside this document without showing limits, a thesis would look something like this. To what extent was the collapse of the Soviet Union due to external foreign political forces? The groupings internal would be all three, A, B, C, evidence in there. The groupings for external would be documents B and C. So what would it look like? Although external Cold War policy fo political forces from foreign countries were influential to a degree, it was internal policy failures that were instrumental to a greater extent in the collapse of the Soviet Union. The reason for this is because documents B and C reveal Western economic leverage and U.S. arms assistance as external forces while documents A, B, and C reveal severe internal, social, political, and economic mismanagement by the Soviet Union, right? Which ultimately resulted in the collapse of the Soviet Union. And that's to that greater extent. So if you stay inside the document, the argument would be this. If you wanna say that external was the greater force, then you have to show the limits of the documents that that reveal internal all right and that's how you would do it so what should we take away from this whole thing the soviet union invaded afghanistan to put down rebel attacks by the mujahadi against the afghan communist government the soviet union's costly and untimely failed invasion of afghanistan it contributed to the collapse of the ussr Mikhail Gorbachev comes around to try to pick up the pieces. He sees all the internal economic mismanagement and all of the failed policies, internal policies of the Soviet Union. And the, and the effects of that are, you can argue, a famine within many of the countries of the Soviet Union. And they had to turn to Western capitalist banks for money, which in turn gave Western powers leverage over the Soviet Union. And all of this led to the eventual demise and collapse of the Soviet Union and the end to the Cold War. Really hope this helps.